Welcome to Database Selection 101, Stakeholders and Decision Criteria. My name is Colin and I'm a Solution Architect here at MongoDB. In this video, we are going to be talking a little bit about database selection, who is involved in that process and what the process entails, as well as focusing on some of the key stakeholders that are involved in the decision criteria, uh, namely database administrators and application developers, uh, and then finally, we'll, we'll cover a little bit of history of kind of what this has looked like in the past uh, and then uh, some forward looking, you know, uh, where we're headed. So for database selection, you know, this is going to be an activity that involves potentially multiple stakeholders. Now, depending on the scope of the application, whether it is internal facing, you know, maybe it's just one department or maybe it's our, our core product. Uh, that is going to be customer facing uh, and as such uh, necessitates the input from multiple departments. So, you know, the, the thing to keep in mind here is this is going to be most likely a very collaborative process. And um, so what does this entail? Uh, well, typically, you know, you will start by defining uh, what the scope of the application is and the specific requirements are. So, you know, if we are building something that is evaluating weather sensor data, you know, an IoT type use case, uh, then, you know, maybe we are going to want to weight databases uh, that have, you know, uh, high write throughput. Uh, or, you know, maybe if it's uh, analytics or transactional, etc. there are different things that, uh, that we'll want to evaluate to ensure that the database that we choose is optimized for our given use case. So now, how is this done? So typically, you know, once we've defined our application and the requirements that we have for the database, there will be a process of elimination. You know, the teams will collaborate and then the stakeholders that are, that are involved will collaborate to narrow down to a, uh, you know, select few solutions. And then from there, the development teams will go about building out MVPs or minimum viable products to basically prove out the functionality and uh, and assess the performance between the chosen solutions uh, to make a decision. And so now, when does this happen? When are organizations uh, and stakeholders choosing new databases? So usually, but not always, but usually this uh, this happens in two different scenarios. We'll have you know one where we're launching a new app, a greenfield application has never existed before. Um, so, you know, we're kind of starting from the ground up or this could be a situation where we're refactoring or rebuilding an existing application. You know, maybe our current solutions have hit scaling bottlenecks or they're just not allowing our developers to iterate as quickly as we would like. So uh, we're going to start looking for uh, a database with more flexibility. So now what do database administrators care about? Uh, well, first and foremost, you know, database administrators have to wear a lot of hats. Uh, and I would say that, you know, a rough analogy would be uh, that DBAs kind of act as mechanics for the database, right? So they are going to monitor and tune and maintain the database, make sure that the check engine light isn't coming on. And if it does, um, making sure that they can quickly uh, address the source of that problem. So the first component that uh, the DBAs will factor for is the operational and maintenance overheads. You know, how difficult is this system going to be for us to maintain? Uh, is there a suite of monitoring and alerting tools that will, that will give us the visibility that we really need to ensure that the database uh, is performant? Uh, we also wanna make sure that there's uh, the requisite tools available for backing up and restoring. So commonly in organizations, you'll hear about RPOs and RTOs, uh, restore point objectives and restore time objectives. So we want to make sure that the tools that we have to back up and restore our data in the event of a crash or, you know, maybe we just want to spin up a new data set elsewhere. We want to make sure that we can do so in a timely and efficient manner. Uh, support services are also very important. So database administrators want to ensure that if there are problems that arise that they can't address, uh, that there is a support team or support channels uh, that can be turned to to assist with those. Um, and then, you know, finally for this segment, we have tuning, optimization, and troubleshooting. Basically, what it sounds like, you know, we want to make sure that our 
um, our database or you know, our, the engine of our application continues to run efficiently. And that kind of ties into the next bullet here, which is service stability. So, you know, given that we want it to be a stable system, uh, we are going to want to make sure that we can design uh, and maintain certain levels of uptime guarantees and, and service level agreements into uh, the database system that we're developing for. Scalability, you know, this is another thing that, uh, that over time, uh, especially, you know, as, as users and workloads and just raw data continue to grow in a data set, you want to ensure that uh, your database can scale with those volumes, right? You don't want to have to refactor or, you know, um, change the um, change the tires mid race to uh, to be able to keep up with your user demands, right? You want a seamless um, back end. And then security, uh, you know, data security, I think is, is paramount, especially these days, uh, when we hear frequently about different hacks and things that are going on. So you know, main, making sure that the database administrators have the tools and controls in place to safeguard data, uh, ensure that only the, the entities that um, require access to the data have that. And, you know, there's different hierarchies of data that, uh, that can be designed for using role-based access controls. Uh, and then also ensuring that encryption is in place, uh, both at rest, you know, when it's sitting on disk and in transit when it's being called uh, by the application or any other service that might be using that data. So now what do developers care about? So, you know, you will see some commonalities here between the two, uh, especially when it comes to scalability and security and performance. But, uh, you know, first and foremost, I think developers, like all of us really, uh, want, want something or tools, want some tools that will make their lives easier, right? So. A developer is going to be brought on to build, uh, maintain, or improve some piece of software or some solution that the, um, that the employer is selling to its customers, whether it's B2B or B2C. You know, so the developer's job is, is really you know, hampered by complexity. So one of their foremost priorities is going to be you know, an intuitive system uh, one that can be queried and interacted with easily. Uh, they'll want programming language support. So, you know, uh, drivers and different mechanisms that allow the application to seamlessly communicate with the database. That's, that's very important as well. Um, as is the development community, right? So there needs to be a large base of other developers that are using this, uh, community forums, and avenues where the developers can turn to if you know they need help uh, getting something to work or fleshing out ideas for you know a data model, etc. And so next we have features, right? So uh, again, kind of going back to making the developer's life easier, a developer is going to want to focus on the features that are inherent to a database. So you know what is this database purpose built for? Is it you know, transactional processing, is it analytics, is it um, time series data, you know, what is it that this database is specifically built for and, you know, relative to our use case. Uh, and, you know, a data model kind of ties in that into that too, you know, how rigid uh, or flexible is the data model, you know, if, if we want to define a schema now, but we don't really know what our application is gonna look like in a couple years, is this database going to become a constraint for us as we evolve? Um, so the third point here is performance, really you know, similar to the DBAs, the developers want the operations that they're developing and uh, sending to the database. You know, maybe they're designing a new feature that's gonna be pushed out to end users, but you know, they don't want end users to interact with this new feature and, um, and experience you know, delays or poor performance, right? Like it's great if you have new feature, features and are pushing them out frequently, but you know, if the user experience is poor and nobody ends up using it, it's, you know, it doesn't do anything for, um, for your application. So you know, efficiency of how the database uh, utilizes its resources, CPU and memory, you know, what kind of optimizations are, are there on that end? 
uh, as well as obviously operation execution times are, are very important to developers. Uh, scalability. So scalability is another factor that uh, that you know both DBAs and developers share uh, concerns for, and it's basically, again, you know, are we going to have to find a, another system, or or will this system become a bottleneck to us in the future, as you know our users grow, our data set grows, uh, and our workload grows, right? Maybe we just uh, maybe we're a gaming provider in the game. Uh, goes viral and all of a sudden, you know, we're, we're kind of buckling under the demand and sure we can scale up our our servers, but you know, one of the biggest constraints might be uh, how we design the data model. Maybe it's inefficient, maybe there, you know, too many joins, things like that. And then finally, uh, and uh, another commonality will be security. Uh, so, you know, ensuring that how we're sending the data from the application to the database is secure, you know, what we're doing with things like PII and how we're differentiating different types of data. Uh, these are all going to be things that uh, developers care about. So a little bit of history. Where have we been? So, you know, relational models and SQL came out in the 70s, right? So they've been with us 50 plus years. And, you know, over time, we have begun to kind of expand and build out the different types of databases we have. Obviously, you know, with MongoDB, uh, you know, 12, 13 years old at the time of this video. And, um, you know, that's a, it's a NoSQL, one of the first document databases. Uh, but, you know, in between SQL's inception and, and MongoDB, uh, there have been a variety of different flavors of databases that come out. And usually when a new database comes out, it's because there is a deficiency in the available databases uh, that the developer or the creator of that new database wanted to address. So you'll see here, you know, we have uh, wide column, graph databases, time series, key value databases, etc. And, you know, really once you start to expand out away from one data store and incorporate multiple, well, it's great in a sense that it gives you that uh, performance and that added versatility that you needed for your specific use case uh, that's evolved over time. But what isn't so great is the complexity that this introduces. So, you know, we have here the ETLs that basically means extract, transform, load. You know, we have our original relational database or all of our data might go into, uh, but then we're going to need to extract specific subsets of data that are important to our graph use case or our time series use case um, to put into those data stores. So, you know, not only does this add complexity, but it adds uh, additional overhead in terms of maintenance, uh, potential license overheads, and then also just workflows. You know, someone needs to maintain these ETLs. And also you need to factor for things like stale data, right? So since we're no longer directly querying the uh, our core uh, data set, you know, can we be guaranteed that the data that we're querying from our time series data set is up to date, right? You know, we, we definitely don't want to introduce stale data. So, you know, this works, but it's, it becomes clunky and, you know, sometimes is only suitable for, for niche use cases. Uh, so then, you know, as we continue to expand from here, uh, we can see that, you know, maybe we have uh, yet another use case come up when we're looking at uh, introducing search engine functionality to our database. So this is yet another component that we need to add in for a full text search engine that is optimized um, and, and also is loaded only with the data that's relevant to us. So again, you know, the, the same problem of copying and duplicating data to multiple places and expanding the operations that we are uh, managing and maintaining. So, you know, this, this kind of becomes a tax on our, on our team, right? Our developers and our DBAs and the DevOps team uh, at large, uh, because, you know, there's a more systems that they're having to touch and far more complexity, uh, which leads to, you know, slower development times and, and more friction as we continue to iterate. And then, you know, finally here we say, okay, you know, we have all these features, great. Uh, but now we want to make sure that, uh, that our mobile users uh, can, can leverage our platform, right? Maybe before this is only 
uh, a desktop or, or web-based type application that we now want to optimize for mobile. And you can kind of see how this expands uh, yet another layer of complexity uh, building out, you know, and, and it's just not something that scales well. It can scale, but it does not scale well. So, the final component here is, you know, now that we have all of these disparate systems and we have, you know, our application functioning the way that we would like it to in terms of features that our end users can make use of, uh, maybe our final mandate is, okay, now how do we uh, how do we gain intelligence or insights from the data? Uh, so, you know, many organizations do some level of analytics. And, and of course, you know, with this, there is yet another component of extraction um, and duplication of data into analytical systems, uh, things that need to be fine-tuned and monitored and, and frequently updated and maintained, uh, not only just for, you know, status quo, but especially so as we begin to introduce new features. So, you know, this is kind of where we've been and this is, you know, workable, but certainly not ideal. So where does this lead us? You know, where are we headed from here? And really, you know, the trends that we are seeing and, and the vision that, that we at Mongo are trying to build towards is building out uh, a, a, an application data platform that is consolidated or unified uh, into a single experience for developers so you know this is basically what what atlas looks like in terms of the different layers of uh, functionality so you know we can see at the top layer here we have our document model you know one of the the core tenants that the mongodb is built around uh, and then we can kind of see the different use cases and workloads that mongodb is suited towards so key value relational graph geospatial time series uh, and you know the, the list continues to expand with each version update uh, that we push out uh, again at the time of this video mongodb is at 5.2 uh, and heavily optimizing for uh, for time series workloads but uh, you know really what what the atlas data platform provides is this single layer the single unified experience where you're not having to maintain disparate systems disparate licenses uh, you're not having to uh, to kind of take this data and duplicate it to all of these different silos. Atlas gives you a unified platform to build value for your customers and focus on what really matters to you, uh, which is you know your differentiating features and functions uh, for the product or service that you provide. So that's it. Thanks for watching.